In the last class, uh, we were looking at brush uh, model, right? And uh, and then we uh, moved on to what we called as a magic formula model, which is due to Pacheca, right? And uh, we saw that uh, we saw that the basically the first model that was put forward in the Pacheca uh, model tire model is to fit the experimental curves that were obtained during tire testing, right? And uh, we will now slightly go into the, into the details of tire models before we, uh, I think we have to quickly go to the lateral dynamics. Uh, we won't have time to go into completely t uh, the uh, tire models. There were some questions on, um, in fact, what happens during combined slip. We will spend a few minutes on, on combined slip uh, before we go to the rest of the topics, uh, including the tire model. But there were a lot of questions on tire models out of the class. So let me, let me explain this. Uh, this is from a, a paper in vehicle dynamics, a vehicle system dynamics. This is the reference. It's a very nice figure. Uh, volume 43 supplement two thousand five eighteen to twenty nine Alex Eichenberger and Marcus. So this is the uh, this is a paper just uh, there's a reference for this and let, let's just quickly run through this so that you understand what we mean by tire models. Uh, as I told you earlier in the class, uh, it started that a lot of codes that are multibody dynamics codes that are used and multibody dynamics becomes extremely important uh, because of the fact that uh, there have been a lot of uh, uh, companies use it and, uh, uh, and that the companies look at how to optimize the vehicles and so on, right? So they use a number of softwares. The software that is used okay, depends upon the reason or why they use this or in other words, uh, it is not one comprehensive software and one comprehensive model, but there are a number of models and the models also depend upon the reason for which they are doing an analysis. Okay? And a part of it is, a, is the tire model. Please understand that we are looking at dynamics of the vehicle. We are looking at oscillations, be it cornering or be it ride or whatever it is, we are looking at oscillations. And the oscillations or the frequencies of oscillations that we are looking at covers a whole huge range. Okay? And the models that you put in should be able to simulate Okay, or um, get you the results in that frequency range. Clear? So there is a frequency range and an amplitude. Yeah. So what do you exactly mean by vehicle oscillation? Is it like for the sprung mass or? The uh, yeah, we will come to that a bit later. Um, but before that, okay, let us understand. Yes, I understand what you are asking. Let's let's look at this figure. Then you will you will see what we want to say. Okay, so the vehicle oscillations can be classified in terms of frequency of oscillation, okay, and the amplitude of oscillations, right? So, um, yes, when you, when you talk about oscillations, immediately you think that there is going to be a, a bounce, you know, a vehicle goes over a rough road and you see that, uh, you know, bounce and so on. And immediately you have a tendency to uh, sort of map this word oscillation to a vertical oscillation, right? But it's not necessary that it has to be vertical. That's what we're going to see now, okay? And you will see that when we talk about oscillations, uh, it, it covers a gamut of things, right? It is like, uh, uh, like the whole electromagnetic spectrum which we, we talk about when we talk about light, we talk about sound and so on. 
Like that, you have a number of, you know, the whole gamut of things that we're going to look at, various frequencies and amplitude, right? Okay. Now, at the lowest end, we look at what are called as quasi-static models, where we study the suspension kinematics. Okay, you had studied, say, for example, four-bar linkages and so on in your earlier class on mechanisms. So you use that kind of concept to understand actually when you give a steering input how, say, for example, the steering linkages move. Okay, what is the arc that it covers, and all those kind of things. Okay, so you use the fundamental uh, concepts in theory of machines or kinematics of machinery which you studied in order to understand that. Okay, so that's the quasi-static models. Right, the amplitudes may be very large because you're looking at when you turn a steering, how things move, and so on, and many times. Uh, the models that you use for a tire, uh, in this case, is a is a finite element model, you know, simple static finite element model, and so on. Right? Okay. We will come to this uh, this um, tire models in a minute. Next, in the range, look at this. You know, this this amplitude can be large. Next is what is called as the handling models. Handling models. Please note, model simply means equations. Next, we talk about handling models. We are going to do that from this class, maybe from starting from next class. Right. We are looking, going to look at the forces that are acting, the accelerations and so on. We had already seen this for the longitudinal case. Handling is more to do with the lateral forces and the lateral dynamics and that we are going to see as the next step and so we are going to ha look at handling models. In these cases, as you are going to see now, uh, you consider the chassis as one rigid body and look at how, for example, the chassis uh, is going to yaw or the body of the vehicle is going to yaw, is going to roll and so on. Right? So we do not go into the details and usually this kind of models look at uh, at a, a, a picture where uh, we look at the whole chassis as one group of components. Yes. So, why does the frequency change for that? Yes, um, good question. So, what, uh, what is that we are looking at there? We are looking at various frequencies. You will understand that. Because this depends upon, see, when we, uh, when we look at handling, it, look, uh, it, it depends upon the frequency of the whole vehicle. Okay? of the vehicle at various modes or in other words in various directions in simple terms. Okay? You would see that we, we will come to this handling uh, when we take a, take a turn, okay, you would see that certain frequencies okay, which are the result of the whole of the vehicle mass, moment of inertia and so on are going to have a role to play. Okay? And those frequencies are in this range, or in this range. Okay? The frequencies which are going to play okay, when we look at lateral dynamics, handling is, is about 4 to 5, 3, and maybe 2, 3, 4. You know, that's the range. So, but the lower frequencies will also be there, right? Yes, of course. See, the, the point is this. Um, is it that I am neglecting all this? No. What we are saying here is that we look at different frequencies to look at the FX. Okay? Look at the FX. For example, if you are looking at noise, yes, you may be cornering, maneuverability. If I am looking at maneuverability of the vehicle and so on, the frequency range I am looking at is this. But at the same time, I am looking at the NVH, the, the vibration characteristics and so on. And then I would comfort, for example, I would look at these frequencies. I am looking at actually acoustics. Okay? I would look at higher frequencies. It is the vehicle is moving. It's, it's that you are, you are artificially distributing it at these frequencies and studying the effect okay, at these frequencies. Go and study, when I say that, go and study the frequency at this range, which means that 
you are looking at handling and that is the result of the characteristics of the vehicle when it takes a corner. Right? And the ride, for example, the next set of frequencies that you are looking at is the ride. Please note, why am I saying this? Please note that the model should be capable of, capable of representing the vehicle in these frequencies. It should be able to represent the vehicle in these frequencies. Okay? Suppose you take a simple model, what we are going to see, for example, bicycle model for handling. Okay? Then if you tell me that uh, I want to study uh, the acoustics okay, with this kind of model, you won't be able to study it, okay? because it will not produce the kind of frequencies, the na natural frequencies or modes or whatever you call it, we are going to give some names to it. Okay? These things will not be represented by that mathematical model. Okay? So, there is no uh, point in having a simple model which we are going to say, I mean study and say that I am going to study this, because that model will not represent the behavior of the vehicle at these frequencies. Does that point make it clear? But as a vehicle, yes, as a vehicle it has various spectrum of behavior as a vehicle. Okay? But many times I would not be able to take everything together and start working and my interest also may not be on all these frequencies. Right. Does this hold good for all vehicles or? No, it holds good for every vehicle. It, it, it is not. Say, uh, heavy yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, the the frequency range may be may be this side that side, but it is it's around less than ten. Okay, uh, let's look at the next set of frequencies. I'll take the question after I finish this. Okay, then we look at the next set of frequencies. We are looking at ride. Okay, looking at ride. Ride usually is divided into two categories. Okay. One is what is called as the primary ride and the other is what is called secondary ride, purely in terms of the frequencies. The lower frequencies at 10, 12 hertz, okay, you would call this as a, as a primary ride. Okay. Uh, people vary uh, when they define what is actually the primary ride, what exactly is the frequency and so on, but usually we will look at uh, the primary ride as one due to the oscillation of the suspension system. Okay. This is because of road induced oscillations and so on, 10, 12, 12, 14 hertz is the type of frequencies that you would call when there is, when the vehicle is subjected to these kind of oscillations okay, at those frequencies, we call that as the primary ride. But then uh, ride is a topic which is not only affected by, note this carefully, that is not only affected by, um, by the road. Okay. Today, ride encompasses a much larger things. Okay? So, for example, there can be oscillations of the engine, transmission and so on which may be at a much higher frequency, maybe about 30 hertz. Okay? So, there may be oscillations of, of, the, uh, of the engine okay, which may be transmitted and your, uh, your um, uh, engine mounts may not be very good, there may be transmission of oscillations due to engine and so on. Okay, then the frequency of excitation due to these factors will be at a higher level or higher frequency and that is what is called as the secondary ride. Right. Then comes harshness, okay, what we call as loosely as NVH, that is comfort. Okay. Uh, that is at a higher frequency, at a much higher frequency. So, in fact, if you look at the total ride, how comfortable I am in the vehicle, then it actually covers the whole thing. Okay? You can also see that as I go down the frequencies, actually the amplitude comes down very well known case. Right? The amplitude comes down. Now, you move to a much higher frequency, okay, which is above 100 hertz. Okay? Strictly speaking, going up to 20,000 hertz, but we are not interested up to that because that is the acoustic range, but 20 to 20,000. But we are not interested in that kind of large ranges, but the acoustic frequencies, which is of interest to us, may, may extend up to about 2,000 hertz. Yes. 
The quasi-static is where I am looking at the suspension mechanics or mechanism, okay, as a, sorry, steering mechanisms. So, suspension, kinematics, steering, kinematics and so on. Yes, so these are oscillations, okay. These are, when I take, say for example, when I give a steering input, okay, how does actually, what is the uh, range to which this, um, the steering uh, has an effect on the uh, wheel and that whether Ackermann steering is completely followed or there may be error, what is Ackermann error, scrub radius, all those blah, 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 all those things. No, they are not, that is why we have, we are saying that it is, it is at a much, much lower frequency. That is why we call this as quasi-static, very near zero. It is, though it is not actually static, we, we call that as quasi-static, so, okay, right. <coughs> Uh, we will we will come to that. You know, these are frequencies when 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 the vehicle is subjected to that that kind of frequencies. Okay, the frequency that whatever happens in that frequency range, we call that as NVH. It's just for us, okay, to understand and give a name. And I'm going to talk um, why we have uh, we have done this as well. Now, I have to have these are the frequencies at which I'm going to study. Okay, I have to have models, as I said. Uh, which will depict these, the behavior in these frequencies. And one of the most important model here is what is called as the tire model. The tire model. Okay. Let us go to the, to the extreme range. Yes. Sir, I mean, uh, you, you mean to say that in vehicle, these all frequencies are available, and at each frequency, these yes, are the frequencies. Yes, 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 yes. These are the frequencies, okay, which will excite the vehicle, various components of the vehicle, vehicle as a whole, or various components of the vehicle. Okay, we will, we will, okay, good, good question. Let me go into that with the tire model. Let us go to the extreme case, okay. Now, I want to study noise. Say, for example, I want to study tire noise. Okay, which means that I am looking at frequencies which are above 100 hertz. Okay? Yeah, that is where the, the usually, um, that is a big topic, usually the range are, why usually the, the range of hearing is from 20 to 20,000 hertz and very interesting factors have come about like for example, uh, your ear is very sensitive to, um, to frequencies of about 1000 hertz. Okay? So that is where you are uh, very sensitive to this and so there are uh, the the magnitude of noise okay expressed in decibels are now adjusted and you have scales like a scale which adjust to the sensitivity of your noise and so on so you are you are sensitive as a as a person see you perceive vibration okay due to various parts of your body right i mean so in, in fact we will see later when we go to ride dynamics Okay, the, the last part of this course, where we will look at right dynamics, we will look at what is the amplitude which your body can withstand without fatigue, how long it can withstand, what is the frequencies, and what is the corresponding amplitude, for example, uh, how, how much you can tolerate, all these things we would look at it uh, later in the course. But if you look at acoustics, you are what your ear is sensitive to, those frequencies are about this. Okay, your, your ear is very sensitive to frequency. That's why you are able to enjoy music uh, whose frequencies, <coughs> okay, what we call in Indian classical music a swara, what, are, what is that? There's nothing but the frequency, okay. Uh, it comes from the Archimedes, Archimedean principle of, of dividing the frequencies into different octave and so on. Let's not go and get into those details. Let us, let's look at this model, you know, let us come back and look at the models, okay. Uh, now, uh, to answer this question, like we are looking at, uh, at acoustics, uh, let's see actually physically, we, that, that's been a practice in this course. So I have a tire, okay. Now the tire goes over some, some rough surfaces, that's all of us know. Then the tire we, we saw uh, in one of the earlier classes, say for example, there are belts that are available in the tire, okay. So the belt starts now vibrating. It is some, something, you know, uh, you've done some course in mechanics. It's something like a shell, okay, St uh, stiffened shell or an, uh, uh, or an 
orthotropic shell, okay, that starts now vibrating because it has gone over yeah, a rough surface, right. So, when it starts vibrating, let us say that it vibrates like this, it vibrates like this, okay. Now, this vibration of the belt, okay, which is actually the sum of various modes or mode shapes of the belt, okay. Now, this vibration of the belt, what does it do? It has, um, it, it displaces, so it starts vibrating like this. So, it, it takes an inner and an outer shape, uh, goes up and down. So, when it goes up and down like this, what does it do? It excites or passes on this to the air uh, okay, molecules which are, which are near this. Okay, that is one of the things. So, it, it starts oscillating. So, the air molecule, molecules near it gets, I mean, into this oscillation, in other words, pressure changes and this acts as a source, okay, for the pressure change and at certain distance, you hear that as noise because these guys are displacing the air above and, uh, you know, below and then uh, that is the pressure wave that starts or that is the source. That is one thing. The other thing is that when they vibrate, okay, when they vibrate, they also change the forces that are acting uh, um, or in other words, if you pl now plot a force or acceleration at the axle level, they also change. Okay. So, in other words, with time, the axle accelerations change and these accelerations now start okay, traveling inside the vehicle and if you are sitting in the driver location, uh, you know, you are going to hear that as well. So, in other words, uh, the noise that is produced okay, passes on through the air and from the air it maybe it is translated or transmitted to the, uh, to the door and it starts oscillating and you are going to hear all those noise. So, tire for example, tire noise is can be classified into what is called as the airborne noise and this structure borne noise through the axle and gets, gets it inside and then you hear this. Now, if I have a model, since you asked this question, now if I have a model which cannot actually capture this, this kind of belt vibration, you know what we are looking at uh, is also a brush model, simple model. Now, I am not able to capture this. Then whatever I do, obviously, I would not be able to capture noise. Hence, that is why models become important. So, what model you use? Unless I have a model which I am able to capture this, which is the source of vibration or excitation at that frequencies, I am not going to produce that frequency in order that I hear this, right. Okay. So, the, our simple brush model for example, will be enough to do things here, but then I need to uh, keep innovating and improving it in order that we do it further. Yes. Sir, uh, uh, why are they interested in only uh, sound and noise characteristics? No, 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 no. I am not saying that we are, why are we interested in noise? I am saying that noise is one of the factors, okay. It is not that I do not want to make too much noise, right. But if we consider some other uh, effects of vibrations, then maybe 10 hertz and 1 hertz also is not. Yes, the every, every frequency is of interest, okay. So, if you are looking, if you are going to make a car and sell it, okay you are going to be worried in this whole spectrum of frequencies. You are going to, you, your car is not going to sell if you say my handling is very good, but only thing is you can't sit inside the noise is very high, right. Oh, the engine noise is very high when you sit inside, but I can handle, uh, my car handling is, is very good. So, every component. This won't work. Even the engine would have uh, vibrations corresponding to… Exactly. So, at different frequencies. So, that has to be now taken care of, isolated, so that you do not hear or you do not feel whatever is your sensory perception is of these frequencies. This is very important to understand this. Yes, this is well known fact in the industry, but, but your know, students, it is very important that you understand, okay, what we are talking about. And the macro picture is extremely important for you to appreciate the course on vehicle dynamics. Okay. I would have given this first, but you would not understand. Now that we, you know what is a tire model, now you know you, you are able to understand that very well. Okay. So, this is, this is very, this is very important uh, for us to look at.
Right. So, the tyre models that are used are now different at, at different, uh, in the different frequency ranges. You have today a set of tyre models which can handle different frequencies. Okay. You have, for example, a model called Swift model. That the name itself is like that, short wavelength intermediate frequency tire model, right. So, that, that may be about 70, 80 hertz and that is the frequency which it can accommodate and that is what you see here. So, most of these models are, yes, we saw an empirical model, but there are semi-physical models as they are called. In other words, the tire is modeled as a consist, consisting of a number of springs, okay, mass systems and so on and that approximates the behavior of the tire. We won't be able to go into the details of it. We have another course actually on tire mechanics where we would talk a lot more about tire. We are not going to do that in this course, but I want you to understand where we talk about and uh, I mean what we talk about and what we are looking at and so on, right. So, this is what is the importance of time models, right? And this, what we call as multi-body dynamics. This is multi-body dynamics, uh, the, the range of multi-body dynamics applications also looks at the dynamic loads, the effect of dynamic loads. For example, when you come to automotive structures, you would look at this carefully. You would look at dynamic loads. What is the load that is transferred, for example, uh, to various parts of the vehicle, for example, to the chassis frame. Okay, what is the effect of this dynamic load, its effect, in other words, what is the durability and all those things also will be studied. What is beyond this is what is called as crash, okay, crash is a, a crash covers a gamut of frequencies, the very high frequencies and amplitudes are also very large. So, that is the, that is the crash part of it, okay. It is a nice picture, it gives you the whole thing and let us get back to what we were doing. Uh, in the last class, uh, right? Rossi static, you told like it's, it's, uh, it's low frequency, it doesn't uh, affect you. So, say for example, if you take honey, you said your, your how does it uh, affect? Yes. Is change with frequency? You have to wait for some time to get an answer. So, what is handling? What is your? How does it have an effect? All those things will be studied in this course. So, in other words, you will get into models here. Okay. I won't be able to get into these models beyond this, but I will get into models which cover this and this, you know, these parts are part of this course. So, you have to wait for some time in order to understand, you know, what do I mean by the second thing, right? We will do that. But frequency, we mean at particular instant, different components has different frequencies. Yes. So, different, it is not different component of the vehicle, you know, this is, uh, we are talking about we are talking about the vibration of the vehicle, okay, induced due to various components. Okay, for example, for example, when you are looking at the primary ride, okay, you can treat this uh, uh, whole body as a rigid body, and we are going to look at that as a rigid body, right? At those frequencies. So, in other words, the frequency is dominated by the um, by the spring dashboard system of the suspension. Okay? So, when, when I go to higher frequencies, then there are contributions at higher frequencies and that may be due to bending of the chassis frame. Okay? So, in other words, the source for these vibrations and the way they are transmitted and so on okay, would be different right at, at different frequencies. So, for example, when I am, I am here, I am looking at the body as a whole uh, controlled by the suspension characteristics, right. Wait for some time, you will understand more about this as we go along. Sir, how do you okay. know at the, low, at the low set of frequencies, the suspension will be, be, be put on the How do you know that the suspension kinematics? The yeah, suspension we are looking at suspension kinematics. We know handling is affected by uh, by these frequencies. So, wait for some time, you know, we will, we, we will come into those things, okay. We will, we will look at these things. Why am I looking at this 
this frequency. Why is it? Because this frequency, when I take, for example, when I take a turn, uh, and we are going to look at this from a very simple bicycle model, and then if I take a turn, then the frequencies which are excited, okay, is in that range, right? Okay, we are going to look at the mathematics behind it, and then we will, we will understand why these frequencies are, why this frequency of 12 hertz, okay? You will see that there is what is called as a wheel hop frequency, and the wheel hop frequency is 12 hertz. You would understand that there is a body, uh, you know, the frequency of the, the whole body that would be at 2 hertz. You don't, you don't wait, you know, please uh, be patient to understand these frequencies. Understand this alone, that, that vehicle as a whole has a gamut of frequencies which can be excited. Okay, which can be excited. And so you have to understand the behavior of the vehicle and all these things. In other words, in other words, just to just to complete this, it's not that I have to excite all these frequencies. In other words, I can isolate frequencies okay, uh, by different means at different levels. For example, I can isolate completely the uh, uh, noise due to uh, the engine. There are ways and means by which you can isolate this noise completely. But that does not mean that the, the technique that I use in order to isolate this noise would uh, make my handling better. So you have to look at what you have. So the, the, the idea of studying this is because the solutions uh, as a design procedure or a design problem is different at different levels. So when you say that this vehicle, in other words, when you say simply put it, when you say that this vehicle uh, handling is fantastic, but my ride is not very good, or vice versa, okay, what is that you are saying? You are saying that the vehicle behavior, or you are characterizing the vehicle behavior at different frequencies. That's all. Okay, you're characterizing them. That's it. Okay, let's move on. Let us now look at combined slip. I'm not going into the details. I thought I would do it, but I think we are running out of time. We have to uh, move to the next topic on um, on lateral dynamics. I just want to point out that when we have combined slip, we are looking at longitudinal as well as lateral. Okay, both of them are acting together. Okay, in other words, the forces in the longitudinal direction and the lateral direction are going to now compete with each other in order to win over the mu into f or fn, right? So, if I now plot, say for example, the force, sorry, fx and the force fy, okay? If I now plot this graph, this would this word, okay, because of, of certain reasons of anisotropy and so on, would become an ellipse, something like this. In other words, what it simply means is that this is due to longitudinal, say, braking or acceleration, and this is due to cornering, okay. When I corner, when I do a cornering without any lateral acceleration, I am going to get the full benefit of my mu. This is the boundary after which, okay, I am going to, it is going to stop and after which I have reached the uh, mu into Fn or I have cast all that is, that is in the bank called the friction forces. So, uh, once I do not have any braking or acceleration, okay, that is the complete force that can be used in order to generate Fy. And that is the end, okay, where I would generate the complete or I would use the complete frictional force in order to get this. Yeah, uh, because this is nothing but the, the force, okay, Qx plus Qy squared, okay, that is the, uh, that is the force, say for example, force per unit unit length uh, should be less than equal to um, 
mu into qz per unit length is what you know qz is a normal force per unit length okay and if you if you give it like this actually it should be a circle but qx and qy need not be the same you know like what happens in the longitudinal and the lateral direction forces uh, that need not be the same because it's the 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 forces are split in the ratio of the of the slip and so on so uh, the the practically this wouldn't be an uh, would be wouldn't be a circle but it would be a sort of a distorted ellipse would this thing that the boundary the mu and value is kind of different for effects and for yes yeah so that is the because the way it is shared is different here so ultimately say for example if you are doing both cornering and breaking that is the type of uh, you know forces that you would generate uh, yeah this is the fx and fy so major axis is see this is a this is an ellipse like this so you can say that that's an ellipse like this okay so you are putting only the one part of it actually the qx and qy is given by i'm i'm i'll just write this quickly when it is in the slipping region per unit length i already said that force per unit length okay so and um, you can you can derive this and and i'm not going to as i said go into the details you can look at uh, pacheka's book so uh, derive this similar same way as you had done it for the longitudinal force now we include longitudinal and lateral force okay and then you can derive this and the fx now becomes look at that I'll quick, quickly indicate after this how we got this. That is F X. Uh, just a minute. Let me let me finish this. I'll explain it. You know, let me let me write down this equation, and I'll explain this. And this would be your assignment. How we're going to get this? Though the the expression looks formidable it's it's very it's not very difficult to derive this it's quite simple this is into sigma x sorry that is the whole thing multiplied by sigma x the whole thing multiplied by sigma y and m is at
Okay. So essentially, what is that? What's that you do? Essentially, how did you get this? Well, it's too much of noise. That's going to have an effect. Yeah, essentially, how did we how did we get this? We got it in the similar fashion as we did before. Remember, how did we get this kind of expression for a longitudinal force? We looked at uh, we looked at the deformation. Okay, you remember that we looked at the deformation. We looked at uh, how much uh, the the tread, which was a brush, deform as you move in into the contact patch and then at a particular point of time we said that the force is not good enough to sustain the frictional forces and it starts slipping. This is exactly what uh, you would do. You would now look at the brush movement both in the x direction and the y direction. So the brush movement in the x direction, so you define sigma x and sigma y as given here and you would, this is exactly what you did previously into sigma y. Now, which, which now becomes the basis for the force, in other words, these are the displacement of the brush, remember that we, we looked at the brush, okay, in the brush model, that is the, we had those brushes. So now, Please understand that there is going to be a longitudinal as well as a lateral, right? Both are acting. So the brush, the, that brush, the, the bristle will actually be displaced in the x direction as well as in the y direction. This is a displacement, right? Go back and look at it. This is what we did before. This would, this displacement would result in a force which I would call as Qx, okay? And the force is because of this displacement multiplied by the stiffness Cpx in the x direction. Displacement multiplied by the stiffness per unit length, you know, gives you the force per unit length. So that would be Cpx into A minus x into sigma x and Qy is equal to Cpy into A minus x into sigma y. right these are the forces now when it slides root of qx squared that is this this whole sum of these forces okay should be equal to mu qz so in other words the sliding distance xs is determined by root of cpx into a minus xs 
into sigma x, okay, this whole whole thing squared because q x squared plus c p y into a minus x s into sigma y whole squared is equal to mu into q z. Remember q z we got it from the parabolic distribution in our earlier class. So, you can substitute for q z solving which you will get x s. Then what do you do? You find out the total force okay, because of deformation plus slip sliding rather. So, the rest of the region it is going to slide up to excess, it is going to stick to form after that it is going to slide. Try this out if there is any question I will answer that in the next class. Okay. Please try this derivation see whether you get this. It is not very difficult because you just want to add then integrate it and you are going to get this. Okay. So, we will not uh, go further on this unless there is a question which I will answer in the next class. Try this out. Okay. Fine. Now, we will uh, we now know that a combined slip is a is more dangerous because whatever lateral force that is required is not given it becomes dramatic in the case of motorcycles gives rise to what is called as high side fall okay, it becomes really dramatic. So, in other words when you take a turn uh, in a motorcycle breaking the motorcycle and suddenly release the brake. We will we'll explain that maybe in the next class starting that. So, you will we'll understand lateral forces. Suppose you are taking a turn braking and suddenly release the brake. What really happens? Now, it is a, it's a very, very sharp turn young blood going fast take a sharp, sharp turn right. Suddenly, you see a kid coming across and just press the brake. Okay. You are still taking the turn and then suddenly release it. Situation is very dangerous. Why is it? Because when I break it, think about it, we will we'll continue that in the next class. Okay. When I break it, I, ha I am at this position, you know, sudden breaking. Right? When I release it, when I release it, my f x now comes to 0. Okay? Immediately f x comes to 0, but my f y is not, is not actually, is not the same as what it was before. f y now actually increases suddenly. So, in other words, whatever friction which was which the longitudinal force was holding now gets transmitted to the lateral force. So, lateral force becomes high. Lateral force should be just enough to compensate for my centripetal acceleration. But lateral force becomes high, whole vehicle okay, turns over, overturns. We will explain that in the in the next class before we go to the lateral dynamics.